Um, all right, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. We've been working through the fruit of the Spirit, uh, and our title for today is Fruit of the Spirit Part 3, Are You Walking a Straight Line? Last week, if you remember, we learned how to walk, W-A-L-K, and we will go through that in a few minutes, but today it's Are You Walking a Straight Line? Now, have you ever been driving down the road and having spent any time in the Keys, you have probably seen this. You've probably seen a DUI test, somebody that's been pulled over and they're getting a field sobriety test. How many of you guys have seen that before? Yeah, we pretty much all of us have seen that in here. They have lots of different tests, right? They do the thing where you got to touch your nose. That's just hard to do anyway. Um, they go uh, the one leg stand and see how long you can stand on one leg. Again, that one's hard to do being sober. Uh, they have something called the horizontal gaze nystrogmus field sobriety test, right? Is that, no, what? This, that, what he said. And they take a pen and they, here, here's, here's a pen like this. You've seen it. And they do like this, okay? And you only have to move your eyes, right? You can't move your head. It's a dead giveaway if you move your head and follow it. Okay, so they do that one. But there's, there's one test that I didn't mention yet that they make pretty much everybody do every time. What's that? You got to walk the line, right? But not only walk the line, you got to go heel toe, which again, I, I'm sober and I can barely do this, okay? Right? And so you have to walk that line. And if you are incapacitated in any way, shape, or form, you're probably going to fall off of that imaginary line, right? So if you're impaired, if, if there is something causing you to be different, you're going to run into problems. Your walk, your decision making skills are going to be very, very off. And if you can't walk that straight line, things are going to go south really fast. Now, here's the problem. We are naturally impaired. We naturally have something wrong with us that is keeping us from walking a straight line in life. It's, it's, it's automatically in us to make poor decisions, to make sinful decisions impaired decisions that lead us to these destructive, filled lives of just sin and just, just problems. That is naturally in us. We don't ever fully get rid of that. So if you guys are in Galatians chapter 5, I just want to read through our passage here, and we're going to break that down. Galatians 5, we're going to start in verse 13. This is Paul writing to this church. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, <clears throat> but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. No, I'm not sharing my password with whoever is requesting. For the entire law, I I'm just, I'm just started preaching from my iPad. This is really weird. I don't have it all figured out yet. So, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit. This was our verse from last week. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, this is a big statement right here, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So our key statement for this series, like I said, and I always say our key statement is if you, if you remember one thing, this is it. It's true followers of Jesus will be identified by fruit, and those are that, that good list that we just read, by fruit and sanctification. And sanctification, we always say, is that process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus, it's growth happening in us that makes us look more like Jesus. Now, we're never really going to arrive at Jesus' status, but that is the goal. That's sanctification. That's this desire in us to get better. Do we still mess up sometimes? Absolutely. Do we, do we still have really bad days and sometimes bad weeks and bad seasons? But, but is there, should there be something in us that's like, no, no, I want to do right. I'm struggling with this thing. And that's God's spirit in us saying, hey, knucklehead, get back on track. Anybody ever been called knucklehead by God? It happens all the time to me, okay? All right, John 15, 8. This is how important it is. Jesus says right here, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Not some fruit, not a little fruit, not as much fruit as you can, but that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. <clears throat> and last week as we learned to walk, W-A-L-K, we said we need to put word before the world. We need to put God's word before everything else. A, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. We, we've got to allow God's presence in our lives to control us and to lead us and to guide us. And today, we're gonna find out what happens when we don't allow God's presence to work in us. L, love your time with God. We need to love spending time with God, love spending time in prayer. Don't see it as a chore. See it as no way. I get to talk to the creator and the sustainer of everything. I get to communicate one-on-one -on -one with him no way. Love your time with God. And then K, keep his commands. That kind of falls on us. That's something that we have to try to do. Again, that's, that's allowed through God's presence and his spirit in our lives, but we've got to keep his commands, W-A-L-K. So, we're supposed to walk in the spirit, but there's a problem here. Verse 16, so it says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, again, this was our verse for last week, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, here's where it goes south. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, <clears throat> so that you are not to do whatever you want. When I was a kid, I used to love seeing speakers being thrown out because what I would do is I would go take a screwdriver or a hammer, however I needed to get into those old speaker cabinets, and I would break those out, and on the back of a speaker, if you don't know, there's magnets. And I used to love to find those magnets and keep them. To me, magnets are fascinating because you have these two things, and if they're the right way together, they'll, they'll cling together. But what do you do? You turn one of those on the other side, and, and, and it's like, you, you can't even really push them together. It's so hard, they're, they're just, and, and to me it's fascinating because like, I'm looking at them going, there's nothing there. That why is this doing this? And it's just like, it, it's next to impossible to get these things together. Same thing with oil and water. You put, you put oil in water and, and it's just, it looks like two completely different things and you can shake it up and you can look at it but you could still see all of those little oil globules. I don't even know if that's a word, globules, but we're gonna, we're gonna use it for today. But they don't mix. They don't go together. And that's a great picture of our flesh and God's spirit. There's, there's this thing where they don't go together. 
our flesh is desiring to do these evil, sinful things, and God's spirit in us is desiring and trying to produce fruit, and, and, and there's like this constant battle within us that we are all fighting, well, all of the time. So in verse 17, it says, for the flesh desires. The, the flesh in us, that's a really strange word. It's, the Greek word for that is sarx, S-A-R-X, if you're taking notes. We're going to learn a few Greek words today. I think it's fun sometimes, I don't know. But this word sarx, it refers to the sinful state of human beings often presented as a power in opposition to the spirit. So our flesh, uh, just us, who we are before Christ and even who we are after Christ, our flesh, the sinful nature that we have in us, this sarx, is completely bent on opposition to God's spirit. Well, that's not good, right? That's a bad thing, but it, it gets worse. It says, for the flesh desires... Now, that word has a humongous meaning as well. That word is epithumeo. Told you we we're going to learn a little bit more Greek today. Epithumeo means long for, covet, lust after, or set the heart upon. Or another way to say it is it's a desire to consume. It's, there's this thing in us, our flesh is lusting after consuming things. It's a lust that is just naturally inside of it. The same word is used in Matthew 5, 28 when Jesus is speaking. He says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So your flesh, your sarks is, is lusting, is epithumeo in after evil desire. I'm just making up all kinds of words today, okay? But your flesh is lusting after evil desires. And again, for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, that's not good news. And that doesn't go away when we become a Christian. That is something that we battle against all of the time. And, and you don't have to try to sin. It happens pretty naturally, doesn't it? Like, you don't have to think about it. Like, I think I'm going to go sin today. I think I'm going to go get in a lot of trouble today. Or, oh, I was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. No. Your flesh, your sarks, is lusting after these evil desires. <clears throat> now, this should scare the life into us. Now, a lesser man would have said that differently and said, you know, would scare something out of us, but I digress. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This thought of whatever is inside of us, our flesh is desiring evil, should scare the life into us. You can never get away from it. You can never escape from that desire. Um, have you ever seen that costume that, that you kind of get into uh, and, and it's, it's an alien and it looks like the alien is holding you? Yeah, that costume right there, have you ever seen that? That's hilarious. Now they have all kinds of ones. It may not be an alien. Aliens may, might not be your thing, but it's hilarious. And it looks like this alien is just carrying you around and, and you can't get away from him, right? That's kind of the same picture. No matter how hard we try to get away from our flesh, it's, it's right there with us. Now, you may say, Trev, you're making it sound like there's no hope for us, right? Kind of doom and gloom here. You're making it sound like we're just in one big mess of trouble. And we're kind of right. But thankfully, Paul does a great job of laying out two ways of living or two lists of ways that we can live. And one, obviously, is the acts of the flesh. That's those evil desires that our lives and our flesh are just bent on doing. And of course, the second are the fruits of the Spirit. So, 
Acts of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 19. Here's our list. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phew, I don't do those things. Or at least I don't do most of those things. But our flesh, our sarks, naturally produces those things in us. And so I'm just going to keep saying this over and over. We're in this constant battle against this. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You ever heard somebody say, just listen to your heart? No, don't. Don't do that. Listen to God's Spirit speaking in you to tell you what is the right thing. So our flesh is bent on producing sin and God's Spirit naturally produces fruit in us. Have you ever heard someone say, well, people are are basically good. We've heard that said a lot, right? I mean, people are good. I mean, they're, 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 they're pretty good. Those people have never been to a preschool classroom, have they? Like, like, no, it is not natural to be good. Because, let's see, let's just look at our list here. Just observing a preschool classroom for like one minute, you'll see hatred, you'll see discord, you'll see envy, you'll see jealousy, you'll see fits of rage. True? And then they're all passed out on the floor, right? That's a whole different thing. So it's naturally in us. There's some evidence right there that we don't learn how to do these sins. We don't over time develop this negative attitude that it's in us from the very beginning. So, but there's a lot of those in there again that maybe you don't even understand what they mean. You kind of know, maybe you don't. I wanna break down every single one. And here's the thing. Our tendency again, because we wanna say, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a good person. Our tendency is to kind of blow off this list and say, well, that's, that, that's for evil people or that's for wrong people <clears throat> because maybe we don't fully understand what a lot of these words mean. So what I want to do is kind of break each one down and show us all maybe we do struggle with more of these than we actually think. So we've got four categories Uh, Paul gives us four different categories. If you're taking notes, you may want to write these down. Number one, the first category that he starts with are the sensual sins. And it starts out with sexual immorality. The Greek word for that is pornea. Anybody want to guess what word we get from pornea? Exactly. That's what he's saying. And so sexual immorality is engaging in sexual activity with someone who is not your spouse. It's a very very broad term. And you may say, well, I don't have a spouse. Exactly. That's it. Next one. Impurity, or another word for this is uncleanness. This is lustful, luxurious living. It's the opposite, obviously, of purity. Debauchery, or other translations say lewdness. This is conduct shocking to public decency. Acts or manners as filthy words, indecent bodily movements. Um, do we see any of this nowadays? Do we see any of this happening in our world, in our society? Now, here's the thing. Here's, here's what we have to be very careful with. When we read that last one, to us in our society now, it's, it's almost normal. It's very, very well accepted. 
try that 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, yeah, that would not have flown. Try going out in public and doing some of the stuff that we do nowadays, it wouldn't have flown. But our tendency is to say, yeah, but see, everybody's doing it. It's okay, that's just normal. It's not normal, but what we do is we digress. And we're getting away from a standard that God has set. Not because God loves to set rules and he wants to keep his thumb down on us because he knows, hey, if you live like this, your life is going to be so much better. I have so much more in store for you. So this debauchery, it's, it's, the picture is someone who is ready to sin at any given time. Like they're just ready. Again, they don't have to think about it. They don't have to plan it out. They are just ready. Have you ever asked somebody, hey, are you hungry? And they don't say yes. They say, I could eat. Now, if I'm hungry, I'm going to let you know because I like to eat. All right, I'm going to say, dude, I am starving. It's been like two and a half hours since I've eaten. I am ready. Let's go. But somebody that says, yeah, I could eat. They're not really hungry, but they're just going to go eat anyway. And that's the same picture of this. Given the opportunity to eat or given the opportunity to sin, they're going to do it. So those are the sensual sins. The next category is religious sins. Religious sins. And the first one here is idolatry. Now, I know everyone here is thinking, I don't have to worry about this one. I don't have idols. I don't, I don't, I don't do any of that. Well, idolatry is the worship of any God other than the one true God of the Bible. So people think idols... They think of statues, they think of sacrificing animals to the rain god in their backyard. Okay, don't do that, okay, just in case anybody's wondering. That's what people think for idolatry. So you're like, I'm safe from this one, I don't have to worry about it. But when people worshipped and they sacrificed to false gods back in the Bible and, and before and when they do, they were really more sacrificing to what those gods represented, like for instance, the God of rain. If they needed rain on their crops, like if you don't have crops, you don't eat. Kind of an important thing. So they would sacrifice to the God of rain. Just we, we want it to rain. Or if they wanted children, they would sacrifice to the God of fertility. Or if they were going to war, they would sacrifice to the God of war. They would sacrifice to those things for those things. <clears throat> Here's what we do now. We skip the God of and we sacrifice or we worship, is another way to say it, those things directly. Maybe not rain, but how about prosperity? How about our bank account? How about different things in our lives that we idolize, that we put before God? Power, success, more for me, more for myself. And when your eyes, your thoughts, and your actions and desires are more on those things than they are on God, that's idolatry. It gets kind of scary when we look at it with some different perspective here. The next one is witchcraft. Witchcraft, the original word for that is pharmakia. It's where we get pharmacy. Pretty interesting here. It's the use of medicine, drugs, or spells, magic, sorcery, enchantment. Now, I'm not against using medicine. I am all for using medicines. You guys know both of my daughters have epilepsy. They take several medicines twice a day. I'm all about that. I'm not calling you to boycott CVS or anything like that. Okay. This is, in the religious sense, referring to the use of drugs and, and mainly the use of drugs to find enlightenment or a higher spiritual sense. And this is actually very, very common. It sounds kind of weird to us. In student ministry, I've actually dealt with students that were struggling in this area. So, that's it for the religious sins. Number three category is the interpersonal sins. Now, here's where it goes really south really fast. Interpersonal sins. 
Don't need to spend too much time on this first one. I think we all know what it means, hatred. Hatred is the opposite of love. And it is the motivator of pretty much everything. And you, you could say, well, I don't hate anybody. Okay? Discord. Discord. Another way to say it is contention. This is a readiness to quarrel, affection for dispute, or an argumentative spirit. Do we know anybody like that? Let me, just, let me just give you a little something extra. If you don't, it's you. <laughs> just putting that out there. <clears throat> Jealousy. Jealousy just says, you shouldn't have that, I should. And that is very much inside of us all to be jealous. Fits of rage. I just wrote, blowing up at the drop of a hat. Probably don't have to spend a whole lot of time on this one because, again, this is something that many of us struggle with quite often. Fits of rage. There's another big one. Selfish ambition. It's doing something only because it will benefit you. Kind of that what's in it for me attitude. That selfish ambition. We talked about this in the Tough Topic series. Dissensions. Dissensions are standing apart, division, or intentionally breaking up or dividing groups of people. You know who's really good at this? And no offense, but teenage girls. Nah, her, mm, yeah, teenage girls are really good in this, says the youth pastor in the front row. Yeah. <clears throat> Man, there are people that will purposely interject something into a situation, into a friend group, into some kind of group of people and then watch this dissension start to happen and then back away and just watch the world burn. There's people that actually like that. Dissensions. Factions. Factions are heresy. It's pushing a self-chosen subjective agenda or opinion. Now remember again in the Tough Topic series we talked about the difference between subjective <clears throat> excuse me, and objective. Subjective is based on opinion. Subjective is I feel this way so this is what I think. Objective is what we can back up with truth or actual facts. And when we have factions <clears throat> When we have factions, we have people that have this agenda, that have this thing that they think is right. There's really no basis except that it's really their opinion, but they're going to push it. Now, do we know anybody in the world that does that? All you have to do is turn on the TV and you see it constantly just pushing their own agenda because it's their opinion or their desire. So that's factions. And the last here of the interpersonal sins, envy. Envy is just like jealousy, except you don't necessarily want that thing that they have. Maybe you already have that exact same thing. But envy is like, you know what? They don't deserve that. They didn't have to work for that. Like, like, do you know how hard I had to work to get that thing? And they just like, they, it was given to them. You are too kind. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's like, they don't deserve that thing. That's envy. Envy. And it's sad to say, but we do that a lot too, don't we? We look at people and we say, ah, they just don't deserve that. They didn't do anything to earn that like I did. So those are the interpersonal sins. And the last three more, they're social sins. Social sins. The first one is drunkenness. 
And drunkenness is defined biblically by being impaired in any way by any substance. Now, I'm not going to go into a, a, a big explanation of all of this. We, we break it down sometimes. But basically, when it's saying when you are a drunk, Scripture says, do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So it's being impaired in any way by any substance. Now, the next one, a little awkward to talk about, a little bit strange, but then when we look at it from a biblical standpoint and see what this word actually means, it really makes sense. The word that the NIV uses is orgies or komos. And this word komos means a village festival, a riotous party or drunken feast <clears throat> which hosted unbridled sexual immorality. Now, with that definition, do we ever see that in our world? I can think of two of them. One of them is about 83 miles south of us, right? At the end of October. It's called Fantasy Fest. It's this riotous party. It's just anything goes. And who cares anyway because I'm probably not going to remember it in the morning, right? That's what that means. <clears throat> and then Paul, <clears throat> Paul's really good at this. He says, this last one, he says, and the like. Our last one is and the like. It just means anything in between in case I missed something, I just want to throw it in here to this category just so you don't think that that was it. That you can create some other wicked sin that I don't know that I didn't even just think of right now. Just anything that has to do with any of those things. <clears throat> What's going on today? And Paul's very good about saying, hey, anything like this, don't do it. That's from your flesh. That's this battle within us. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to guess that you don't feel better about yourself after this message so far, right? <laughs> Just going to go out on a limb and say, I pretty much ruined it for you, right? They're like, That's this, honey, this is why we don't go to church, Okay. <laughs> I, I apologize if you are a guest here today or if you're just kind of checking us out. It's not normally like this, but, but I'm not done with the message yet. Okay? Here's the thing. Verse 21, the second half, it says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, really scary verse. Because remember, these things are naturally inside of us. Our flesh is lusting after those things. I wrote this down as I was studying this week. With a heart that is bent towards evil, you are three blinks away from struggling with some of these some of the time to an all-out acceptance of these acts of the flesh. We as human beings, and I don't know why I chose three blinks, but we are three blinks away from just saying, you know what, I don't care anymore, and accepting these things. We have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of the lie that the enemy is putting out there that says, these things are so much better than what the Bible says. This is way more fun. Why would you want to live that boring life that God tells you to? And that's a lie. I was <clears throat> listening to my daily devotion this year. It's the Bible in One Year by Nikki Gumbel. And I think it was on Friday, and he said something, and I was like, ah, that's it right there. He says this, he says, at the heart of sin is unbelief. Ever since the Garden of Eden, the deceitfulness of sin has caused us to doubt God's goodness, his love for us, and his word. Did God really say? Or, you will not surely die. 
you always swallow a lie about God before you swallow forbidden fruit. For us today, it is still the same. If we really believed God's love for us, his goodness and his word, then we would not fall for sin's deceitfulness. So true, so true. And thankfully, there's good news. Thankfully, there is hope. I know I have painted a pretty grim picture this morning and basically told us all that we are dirty, rotten, black-hearted, filthy sinners doomed to hell, right? It's basically what I did, myself included. But there's really, really good news. The second half again of verse 21, it says, but I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God and then the very next word changes everything. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, and he goes on. That word, but, and I always tell you, as you're reading Scripture, you have to look for these things. Because Paul, as I just did, made this huge stance to say, you are doomed. You have no chance. It doesn't look good for you at all. But, but, that is one of the most important words in all of Scripture. But God demonstrated his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But, the fruit of the Spirit. We do not have to live this way, fulfilling the acts of the flesh. There is a better way. We're going to look at that in future weeks, starting next week. What are these fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, forbearance. What are they? How can I live by them? But this is so good that Paul right here gives us some hope. And we have to make a conscious decision and a constant effort to allow God's spirit to produce fruit in our lives. That's how we cannot live pleasing the flesh. Let's pray. God, thank you for the buts in scripture. Thank you that there is hope. God, thank you that you have made a way for us to not live in a way that we satisfy our flesh. God, thank you for your son, Jesus, who came and lived among us as an example for us and showed us how to display the fruits of the Spirit. In everything he did, everything was covered in love. God, help us to live like Jesus. God, help us to understand that there is a broken and a dying world right outside of these doors that we are called to love. God, help us to throw out any preconceived ideas of what religion is and just think Jesus. God, thank you that Jesus did come and die for us so that we can live forever with you. And God, if there are some this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, right now in this moment, would you convict their hearts? Show them, God, make them understand their need of a Savior. God, may they have the courage and the boldness to seek you. And God, you promise us that when we seek you, we will find you if we seek you with all of our hearts. Thank you, God, that you are good. Thank you, God, that you are not just waiting for us to mess up so that you can zap us. But that your faithfulness, as we just sang, your mercy, your grace is abounding. It's new every morning. God, thank you for that. 
God, thank you for the family of Island Community Church. Thank you for this journey that we are on. And God, you are just moving in so many areas. God, use us in a way that we will do things that don't just matter in this world, but that matter in 10,000 years. Help us to be a church that is a light to this community and this world. God, we pray for this time of offering. Help us to be generous. Help us to use your money, your resources, in a way that we can reach others like never before. God, we pray all of this in your awesome, amazing, and holy name, the name of Jesus. Amen.